Hey everybody. I have a microphone. Let me see if things are working on YouTube. Cool. Thanks for joining today. I'm going to be talking about GPIOs and PWM usage in Zephyr. Um, thanks, very special thanks to Ajit who had suggested this topic. So um, we're just gonna dive right in. Um, let me get the chat out of the way. I don't need that yet. But if you haven't already, um, please subscribe, uh, send me a message, leave me a comment. All that helps uh, kind of guide what you want to see um, in these live streams every week. So I really appreciate all the feedback that I've gotten from everybody because it just keeps making this live stream a little bit better every single time. So, um, and we'll dive in. So GPOs, interrupts, PWM. Uh, your microcontroller is basically useless without GPOs. <laughs> you can use it for certain things. Maybe it has like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or something, but um, without a GPIO, you're you're dead in the water. Uh, but uh, so we're going to be talking about that functionality here. We're going to be configuring GPIOs. We're setting up interrupts. Gonna um, and then separately, un kind of unrelated to the GPIO peripheral, or at least the GPIO device in Zephyr. We'll be configuring a PWM, the PWM device, and then we'll be just a very quick intro on animations to give you an idea of uh, how to do that in your own code. <clears throat> so GPOs and Zephyr, the easiest way to do it uh, that I have found, and maybe um, Zephyr experts out there, you might have some comments uh, on how you do it. Uh, is by using either the button device tree definition, the LED device tree definition, or the PWM LEDs definition. Uh, you can also create your own device tree definition, uh, which I have for other things that just control a, a GPIO for power reasons or whatever. So the naming, um, at least the naming isn't confusing because if you set it up as like a switch or an LED, it's like, this is an LED. Uh, so, but this is where we're going to be concentrating mostly on today um, in all of the, oh, what, 30 plus slides. <laughs> um, so we'll jump into what it looks like in the overlay. And uh, this is the default overlay from this, the uh, NRF9160 Feather. And essentially you have this section of LEDs. <clears throat> you basically, um, set the compatible to whatever the device tree um, uh, module name is. In this case, we're using the, the um, kind of the Zephyr vanilla GPIO LEDs functionality, um, setting that label to blue underscore LED, and then we're setting the GPIOs for that control. So the, um, the first entry there uh, is that GPIO zero, that is the port. If you have a device that has multiple ports, it's gonna be GPIO zero, one, two, three, um, on the NRF9160, there's only one port, but on, let's say, um, NRF52, there are two. So it's just something to keep in mind. You gotta make sure you're defining the right port. And then the second entry there is that pin number. And um, the third option is flags. And the flags are very helpful. It basically sets the state of the device, of the pin, um, so you can you can um, kind of set those same defaults. Like you know, it's just going to be a, an input um, for the life of that firmware. Then you can set it here. You can set it if you want it to, to be pulled up or you know, pull up, pull down. And of course, if you have an application where you're actually actuating those things in real time, you can change them there too. So this is not set in stone. Um, there are ways to work around it where you can kind of set it the way you want it to. So. Um, here is the buttons definition. Uh, if you look down uh, towards it, same kind of thing here, the compatible or looking at that device tree definition called the GPIO keys. Um, the difference here is we're actually, uh, or the similarities I should say is that we're still using that GPIO's entry. Uh, we're setting the port, the pin number, and also the flags. You can also see that the flags are, the flags are slightly different compared to what the other one was with LED because we're actually using an, an, an input rather than an output. 
got to get that T action. So in order to use GPIOs, we need to turn it on. And uh, in, in most boards, because it is such an essential module set of functionality, um, it's usually enabled by default. Uh, for instance, the NRF 9160, uh, I believe I've either enabled it at the device tree definition or it's actually defined at the device level. So as an example, other devices might not have it, it enabled. So you might have to go in there and just add this to your prga.conf. Not a big deal. <clears throat> So what we're going to do is we're going to fetch the entries from the device tree. So you've already seen the device tree entries. Uh, we'll set up a the kind of device pointer. Um, we've already kind of talked about the idea of like creating devices for different things. Like um, the device pointer for say an LAS 2DH accelerometer is actually just the same abstracted device pointer that you can use for any other type of device on your system. So it's just like this kind of just pointer to this device that you can kind of reference back. Um, and all that stuff gets set at compile time. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. But then we're going to check that device, make sure it's valid uh, because that stuff happens at compile time. And if you have some type of weird assignment issue at compile time, that's not checked. That can't be checked. So it's actually getting checked at runtime. Goofy, but this is where when I got into Zephyr, I was like, I just want to toggle a GPIO, like on and off. That's all I want to do. I don't want to set up a device and see if it's valid and all this goofiness. Um, but now that they're, now that I understand they're kind of abstracting the way they abstract things and how they can share that device across you know, it can be an A2C device. It can be a GPIO device. Um, it makes a little bit more sense, but it adds a little bit more work and it's definitely cognitively difficult, especially coming from a platform where you don't have to do that. It's like, give me the function call that just sets the, the LED, sets the pin on and off. Come on. Um, drawbacks. But once you get used to it, once you know how to get that information from the overlay and you're able to get that device working, you can play around and and do what you need to do. Um, finally, we will configure those pins. So, and then in this case, I think I'm setting it as a, an input, but we'll see in a second. <clears throat> so here are some nice confusing uh, macros <laughs> um, that are everybody's favorites. Uh, so what's happening here is we're, is we're grabbing, so we're, we're referring to the uh, label of that button in the overlay. So if you go back, if you go here, you can see we're referring to that exact label. What we're doing is we're pulling that element out of the device tree and we're then pulling the sub elements from it and getting the, the device. So in this case, we're looking for GPIOs. We're getting the pin number, which we know is three, I believe, right? Or in this case, 12. Um, and then we're getting the flags, so we saw we saw that the flags are those are the ones in that third option there, and they're wrapped in parentheses because they're being ORed together. Uh, so we're grabbing those because those are those are essentially set at their macros are just getting set at compile time, and then you can use them later on in your code depending on what operations you're doing. But this is like this is kind of like the gotcha. This is like the confusing part about how to. This is how you're getting the data from the overlay and you're bringing it into your code. Because there's this like translation layer, uh, you're setting it here in the overlay and somehow you need to get it into your C code. So this is the way folks at Zephyr, um, it's kind of based off of Linux and how they say, set up their overlays and their device tree definitions and then they grab and get that information and use it inside the C code. So it's been, it's very, Anybody who's done Linux development, this is very simple, very familiar. Um, but for the rest of us who spent developing in embedded world, or maybe we're just setting the pins in a header file somewhere, like what is what is this? Um, but it makes more sense when you start thinking, oh, like now I can just if I want to change the processor, all I have to do is just create a device tree overlay and just set the same names 
I don't have to worry about all this funny business. I just literally change the name of the board when I'm compiling. So that part's like, phew, like, oh, okay. This is why they have it the way it is, the way they do. <clears throat> and then um, once we have those de definitions, so if you the we're, we're working with button underscore dev that under the uppercase guy, and if we, if we go back here. You can see that second line there. That's the, that's the device we're getting. So we're looking for GPIO zero, and what that that uh, macro is doing is grabbing that guy, and we're going to be using it um, as with the device DT get macro. So again, that is happening at compile time. It's grabbing that device, and we're setting it to that pointer. Um, and then if there's any errors or weirdness or maybe it compiles but it doesn't actually have that device, then it's also getting checked at runtime. And here is the check. So um, in typical Zephyr code, it, your device needs to be checked to make sure that it's not null. Um, or if it's null, then we, we return an error. And also uh, because we're using device DT get, which is the preferred way of assigning devices um, in newer versions of Zephyr, just need to make sure that the device is ready. So you just got to do both things. Um, it's kind of a safety thing more than anything. So you don't, you're not doing any operations on null pointers or, or devices that aren't ready or have issues. So <clears throat> here's the fun stuff. So we've, we've, we've climbed the mountain, or at least the, we've gotten to like halfway up. All right. We've done all the silliness. Now we're actually like configuring a GPIO and we're going to be setting it to be used somehow. Um, you look at it here, the first argument this should be familiar because that's the device that we've just set up and checked. The next argument is the, the pin number and we got that button underscore pin from the macros defined at the top of the file um, through the device tree. So we go back there. Da -da 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 -da. That should look familiar. That's the third line where it's we're getting that pin. And then the next argument is the button flags, which is the last line there, which is just getting the flag entries from the uh, device tree. So run back here. So we're configuring it. In this case, we're configuring it as, a, as an interrupt. And I believe uh, because it is an, um, being set as an input, it is. It probably has some to pull down or pull up, and that's all included in the flags. And then we're just checking for an error. Return the error if there's any type of error. Typically, because this stuff is so statically allocated and set up uh, at compile time, you're typically not going to get any weird errors. Um, maybe I've never seen GPIO configuration errors in Zephyr, but you want to check for errors. Probably not a good, not a bad idea. Um, but you see the, the, here's like the usage of button flags, just to r r kind of put a bow on this and it, it corresponds to the flags in the overlay, kind of like how I mentioned. And these are the flags in this case that are being used. Here we go. So it's a GPIO pull up and active low. So the first thing is it's setting that pull up pretty self-explanatory and active low is just setting kind of the, um, the interrupt threshold where um, if we're going to be setting an interrupt on it, we want it to, what's the polarity of that interrupt event? Do you want it to be active low or active high? And it really depends on whatever your input is. And that's the flexibility. Uh, you can set it either way and it'll be configured either, either way. Uh, and you can take a look at these particular flags, the ones that you can put in your overlay, and that is available in Zephyr, include DT bindings, GPIO, GPO.h. So just remember that. A lot of the learnings that I've had over the past couple of years playing with Zephyr is actually just looking at the code. I know, Sai, the documentation could be better in some places, and it's just some of it's very confusing, like all these crazy macros. But um, just looking at the code sometimes, you just got to jump in and just be like, I just got to look at this header file and you know what they've commented it pretty well. So, and I think all those comments are in the documentation. So I don't know, maybe it's just more context when you look at everything in line, it just helps.
So that's my recommendation. Uh, here are the then here are actually some examples of what um, what the flags are. So GPIO active high, um, active low, and the, like the pull ups. They're all all next to each other in the file itself, but I kind of smushed them here so you could just take a look at like one of some of the options. And they are bit flags, so they need to be or together uh, to indicate whatever end state you want the device to be. You know, active pull up, active pull down, or pull up, pull down, active high, active low. Um, they are some of these are mutually exclusive, so just um, something to keep in mind. And then um, if we are working with a button, say nobody wants to be pulling that button. Cool thing is you can set up interrupts. Um, so you can set an, up an interrupt on a GPIO, and uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be configuring those um, interrupts. Uh, using um, some there's some some flags in there in the zephyr include drivers gpio.h you'll see them in a second we'll be setting up a callback um, and the pin mask and i'll explain that in a second and um, we'll be adding the actual the callback we'll be like setting up the callback and it'll be adding it to be used and enabled so hopefully that'll make sense in like two seconds um, this is a bit of a <laughs> kind of hard to read. It's kind of small, but um, you you look at the top there, and uh, it's the function call to actually in, uh, enable interrupt is GPIO pin interrupt configure. So we're configuring the GPIO here, and um, what we've already done, we've already set the polarity. So now we're just setting the the GPIO interrupt type. You can actually set it like up. Um, you can have it like up and down, or you know, both directions: edge rising, edge for falling, um, and uh, and then also uh, the pin number. We've already seen button underscore pin a couple times. That is the pin number that we got set earlier, and in all those crazy macros. And then I've just copied uh, some of the entries in that GPIO.h in the bottom here. You can kind of see um, what's going on there. So this is a Sorry to make it confusing, but there are two separate gpio.h files. One is related to the device tree, and one is related to uh, to the uh, GPIO peripheral itself when you're actually calling the GPIO API calls. So glad I confused you, because um, it can be confusing. <laughs> um, so. There, there's the configuration, and what also I didn't show here, let's see. So we're setting the interrupt on the pin. So that's just setting up the interrupt. But now we have to actually set up a callback to actually get some type of feedback. Because if you just set up the interrupt, nothing's gonna happen. You're not gonna know when you have a GPIO uh, event or not. So we gotta set that up. Uh, GPIO init callback. So. This is the guy, um, and then what's what's happening here is there's a a, a struct that we're using um, at the top of the file or wherever you want to put it, and that's kind of containing all the kind of uh, kind of information about that callback, so you can always remove it later if you want. Um, kind of all the context for that guy. So that first argument is the is the struct that holds that information. Then the second argument is the button event or handler or whatever you want to name your handler for that um, for that callback, and then the the last is actually a bit mask of which pin you want to enable for that callback. Now I didn't quite get it at first. I was like, what bit? Why is it? Why is it a bit mask? And then um, and then it's like, oh, okay. If you have multiple callbacks running at the same time, maybe even in different contexts, you want to only enable the callback that is applicable for this particular, or you want to enable the, the pin that is applicable for this callback. So you'll see in a, in a second the, what the callback function looks like, and it gives you a pin, it gives you the pin number as one of the arguments. So if you have one callback somewhere in your code for a interrupt pin for the i square c that's going to be set up just the same way as you would set up your button so you can add and enable 
certain uh, certain pins for those contexts. So you want to make sure that you're setting the bitwise, you know, that those bit flags. In this case, using that bit macro uh, to to enable only that pin to go over that particular call. And what in the background, what's happening is when an interrupt fires, it goes through those routines and makes and just checks that mask and says, okay. I got a callback for this pin. Is this callback? Do I need to call this callback? And that's how it f kind of filters through and keeps different callbacks in different contexts from um, from like interrupt. Like you don't get a button interrupt on the I2C device interrupt. Kind of prevents that from happening. And the cool thing is you can have multiple. And the whole idea here is you can have multiple callbacks uh, going through this. Uh, uh, Without having to just having like one interrupt routine, you can have one for your accurate C stuff, and you can have one for your button, and you can have one for whatever sensor you want. Um, so hopefully that kind of gives you an idea. It's like okay, we're setting up the callback, we're setting the mask, and the thing is, if you have functionality where you have multiple pins that are related to a specific piece of your code or module, you actually bitwise or uh, those two pins together. So say you have two pins that are part of the same functionality, they can call the same callback if you want. It's all up to you. So you can change that bit. You can I think you can or you can or the bit and you put one pin number and then you or it and then you put bit and then whatever pin number you want. So uh, so it gives you flexibility. And because of the abstractions, that's just kind of how the way it works and how you get multiple GPIO interrupts that can play nicely with each other. And then finally, you have to add that callback. Um, so we've initialized it, but we need to actually associate that callback uh, with the, you have to associate the callback with the, the, the button device, um, which in this case is GPIO zero. And then it turns it on and then you get that callback. Um, and then it's whatever you set the polarity to and the rising edge, falling edge, change, whatever, um, that's how it, it gets turned on. Um, like I said, you said this is that bit macro to kind of choose what pin is being utilized. Um, and if this flag is not set correctly, which I've done a couple times, I'm like, why am I not getting interrupts? Uh, <laughs> the callback will not work. Um, you'll know, you, it'll, the GPIO uh, code on the back end you know, in the Zephyr APIs will basically not, it, it won't pick it up because you didn't set the filter correctly, essentially. That that bit, um, that bit mask entry is essentially a filter. Uh, and then um, multiple callbacks can exist for uh, for different GPIOs. And also you can use the same callback for many, for a couple of GPIOs. So it's all up to you. And um, because that you get that pin number in, or that I think it actually gets returned as a mask. You get that pin mask as to indicate which pin is the one that actually got fired. Um, so you got you got flexibility and options there. Uh, then um, so the a callback. So I mentioned that there's a this, that struct holding that context information, and it's it's called GPIO underscore callback, and it's probably should be in that gpio.h file. And uh, that that guy is the one that's actually holding the context for the callback. So you can create it, you can initialize it, you can add it. And then maybe later on the code, you're like, don't need it. You can actually remove, you can remove that uh, gpio callback using that pointer to that or to that struct. So it's, it's handy to keep around if you're gonna be, um, uninitializing that pin, you know, removing the interrupt. So, uh, and da, 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 da. in this case, it was called, um, because we're using the button, I just called it button underscore CB uh, underscore data. So, and as I mentioned, you can move it and we've already covered, let's see. So, <clears throat> and then one other thing mentioning that uh, disabling a GPIO is that the, the, the interrupt is still enabled on the on the back end, even though you might have removed the callback. So you just got to make sure you also, you remove the callback and then you also disable the interrupt. It might be using more power, it might be not, it might be okay, but it really depends on your application and depends on the hardware you're using, things like that, so. And this is what the, the callback handler looks like. So 
it returns the device that's being used. So in this case, it's just returning a, probably a pointer to the GPIO zero. Um, the callback, which I'm trying to remember. It does have a pointer to some type of callback. I'm trying to remember, maybe that's something that's put in earlier. I will get back to you guys on that if we do a follow up on this. And then the pins is also, it's, I'm pretty sure it's just the mask of what pins are active at that time. What, the, what are the ones that actually fired that interrupt? So technically you can get multiple at the same time. So something, something to keep in mind. And that's just like bitwise operations. Just if you have a case statement or however you want to filter it through or um, if this, and then you have another if statement just to make sure you cover all your bases if you're doing multiple if you're doing mul multiple pins for a particular callback so. <clears throat> um, before I move on to GPIOs I, there are a bunch of questions so um, I'm going to answer them because I don't want to get too far without um, going through the questions so NTN 888 thanks for doing this you got it. Um, Jerry Schumann, I have multiple stacked cats. Uh, how do I determine which GPIO pins are unused by the hats or does it even matter if they pass through? Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about like daughter cards where they're stacked together, either like on a feather or whatever platform. Uh, you'll have to look at the schematic really for each one and see what's being used. Uh, that's really the only way to know. There's not really any way to do that in software, um, unfortunately. So, uh, <clears throat> and then Droby, good to see you. Um, so, button pin is not already in the device. I mean, in um, GPL pin in our configure, uh, why is pin needed? So the, 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 the device is actually, so the question is essentially, we, we have the device that we get from the device tree, but what is that device really? Is that device just the GPIO or is the device, the GPIO um, peripheral part of the process, processor itself? And the answer is, that when you pull the, devi the device from the device tree, you're referencing the peripheral that's controlling that pin. So if I'm, if I'm get getting the device for the button, let's just say, uh, the, you're actually pulling whatever the uh, GPIO um, peripheral that's being used. So when you're pulling up that device, like the LED underscore device or Bluetooth on, or uh, button underscore device, that's actually the GPIO interface, not the button itself. That's why you need to ha continue using that button pin argument. So um, that's pretty much, so for that, this is a little bit different than let's say an i squared c device where if you're pulling the device, actually it's about the same. <laughs> um, if you're pulling an i squared c device, you are pulling the particular I squared C peripheral that is associated with that device. So it can be I squared C zero, one, two, three, whatever. Um, same thing here. So if you're pulling that device, you're getting GPIO one or zero or one, two, three, depending on how many GPIO peripherals you have on your device or G GPIO banks. Um, and then you always have to set, like for I squared C, you set the address. For GPIOs, you need to set the pin number in order to configure it. So. Hope, hope that helps. Um, so we'll jump into uh, PWM and then uh, we'll close this thing out. If you have questions, put them in the chat before uh, we get to the end so we can get them answered. Um, so it's very similar. It's PWM is very similar to GPIO. And uh, the in some cases, PWM overlay, when you're defining the PWM overlay, uh, for other devices, they actually have like the polarity flags and like the GPIO, similar to the GPIO flags. Uh, for Nordic, for what I, when I was playing around with it, uh, Nordic, they do not, um, that's not part of it. So you, you just set the pin number and that's it. Uh, and you have to make sure that you actually enable the PWM module 
uh, just like you would uh, the GPIO module, but the GPIO module is on by default versus the PWM module is probably not on by default. So, and we'll get into that right now. Uh, here is an example of like defining a PWM LED. Uh, it's just using device tree entry, that device tree definition of PWM LEDs. Um, the, the label here is PWM underscore LED zero, and that's important to note here. Um, because that is the device label we'll be using in a second. And then uh, here's where things get confusing. And I'm sorry, it's confusing. <laughs> but the when you're setting this PWM, it's like when I first got to it, because this is the first time I've actually used PWM on Zephyr. And I was like, how do I associate a GPIO with the PWM? Because it's not uh, not the same configuration method. And what I've found is, and in some instances, if you like, if you're setting uh, interrupt pins, they don't use the, like the GPIO definition. They just use a simple number. And if you have multiple ports, you're like, how does that work? And because it's like you have 32 pins and you have another 32 pins. Well, what they do here for these type of entries is that they. Uh, it's basically you have the first port, which is 32 up to 32, or in this case, it's indexed to zero, so it's up to 31. And then the next set or next um, port is the next set of numbers, so uh, 32 through 63. Um, that it would be port two. So if you had two ports in here, and if you wanted to use pin, if you wanted to use pin 32 on port one, which is the second port, then you would have to be putting in 63 instead of 31 or 32 or whatever. Confusing, right? Um, but in this case, uh, we're using the same L the same pin number because there's only one port on the NRF9160, trying to keep this simple. Um, we're using that same pin number. So uh, the LED pin on the NRF9160 is pin three. So in this case, pin three. Easy, right? Uh, the only thing here is if you want to add more PWMs, you might have to use a different PWM. Um, so it's referencing here PWM0. It'll give you a bigger view here. Uh, it's showing PWM0. I haven't played with putting, putting multiple PWM devices on um, in an overlay. So if you have experience playing around with it, let me know. But I think it, it, as, you inc as you add more PWM entries, you probably have to increment that device name. So PWM123, but not 100% sure on that one. So, But we'll stick to one for now just to get things working and then we'll go from there. Uh, as you can see, you just want to enable PWM using uh, in, the, in your project configuration. So, And uh, this should look really sim uh, familiar and it might invoke some tears, but uh, yes, there are macros for setting up and um, setting up all your PWM controller, channel, flags, so on and so forth. Uh, the When you're pulling a device, you're going to be pulling the controller. So that's just something to know, and uh, you'll see in a second. But uh, And then you have the channel, which I, I, it's the, that number at the, um, or that the channel is the pin number. And then you have any flags. In this case, I guess I didn't really need the flags here because there are no flags. So we're getting that device using device DT get. This should look familiar because this, this is uh, this is what it, I just did earlier with the GPIO, except we're getting the PWM device rather than the GPIO device. So making sure it's not null, and we're also making sure that it's ready. So and then. Um, the nice thing about PWM setup is like once you have the device in, you can just start using it. It's pretty cool. Um, we're, we're, in this case, I'm just using the PWM set uh, microsecond functional, uh, function. And uh, we're putting that device as the first argument, um, setting that channel, which is essentially the pin number, as the, uh, as the second argument. And then um, the third argument, I think, is just the, the denominator of what you're kind of the timing interval that you're kind of basing things off of. And then that last 
that la- or the second to last in- um, entry is the, the kind of like the the PWM duty cycle essentially, um, and I'll show you that in a second how uh, at least how I found it was calculated in Zephyr kind of the way they're doing it, and then the last one is just the flags if you have any flags for that particular pin so. Um, we're checking for an error, and we're going to return because we don't want to be playing with a device that has errors. So, um, and this, so this call isn't like a once and done thing. This is a call that you're going to be using, especially if you're doing any type of animations or anything. This is the one you're going to be calling, like every 200 milliseconds, every 500 or 50 milliseconds, however you know, however fast you want to update your LED. Uh, so the pulse. In this case, we're just doing, um, we have like a duty, the duty cycle, so that duty um, entry there in that calculation, we're just zero to 255. And then depending on the polarity of the LED, depending if it's um, you know driven by, a, it's um, driven high by a PFET of some kind or driven low or, you know, by some type of NFET, it really depends on your configuration. Um, then the polarity of your device will differ. So uh, the device I'm, or the LED that I'm using is actually, it's hooked up to the rail, the power rail, and then it goes into the device. So it's, it's, it's driven low, or you know, the current is driven through the NFET of the output of the pin, the GPIO pin. So depending on that, you're either gonna be, zero is gonna be off or the, the actual PWM period um, is going to be, um, is going to be the uh, off condition, or vice versa. So you just gotta play around with it and then tweak it as you need. Because I was like, when I was playing with mine, I was like, why isn't zero turning it off? I was like, oh, polarity is reversed. Got it. Um, and then in this case, at the top of the file, uh, this was from kind of some other PWM sample. So I was just using that one in this case. So they're saying, PWM period calculated for 50 hertz signal in, mil in microseconds. So just using that definition as the kind of the basis for updating the LED. Now, here's where the fun stuff comes. So you can, you can set it statically. You can say, meh, I just want 80% duty cycle. I want 20% duty cycle. But you can also uh, essentially set up a timer that fires on a consistent interval and you can set up a a map essentially, or you know, a, a, an array of all the different values at different times. So, if I wanted to set up a glow pattern like this is set to turn it on and turn it off in kind of a slow pattern, you can kind of predefine that statically in your code, and then on that time interval, you can kind of increment to the next entry and set the PWM levels to kind of set your LED as necessary. This is a trick that's used by a lot of people just to get basic animations, things things like that going for their device. So in this case, that's what I did. I just set up a very basic static definition off and on, or you know, uh, glow in this case. And um, oh, here are the timers. So I'm gonna show this a little bit more. So uh, this should look familiar for many of you. Uh, I did talk about timers in a previous uh, live session. So feel free to click back and check out the those if you haven't seen it. Um, but I'm just defining a, a PWM change timer and then change, you know, setting that function call, uh, that callback. And then um, in this case, I was just setting it to, to fire every 200 milliseconds. It's a little bit too slow, but it's, it's, it's enough for what uh, I needed at the time. So, and that, and that, case, and that call is, is repeated. So it happens over and over. It's not a one shot timer. So, and then if you ever have to stop the timer, you can use the K timer stop. Uh, API call and what it's doing and I think I have the function do I have the function here I do it's a little bit of a um, hard to read it's kind of small but um, so on it on change and what I've done here is like I could have you could have different modes and I put it into a switch statement um, in this case I've only shown that the app indication glow function and uh, once you start it, and then you just increment that pattern index essentially uh, into each element as the as the timer call after after as the timer gets called, it pulls up this function. This function actually runs 
um, as part of the system work queue. It doesn't run in the ISR context. Context. So that's something to remember. If you're really picky on timing and you need it to be perfect, uh, you might have to do some fiddling with uh, ISRs and actually talking directly to a timer peripheral. So that's just something to remember. If you if you're trying to you know have like perfect timing for your LED animations or whatever, in the most part, like human eye can't see like microseconds, so it doesn't matter. Um, so we're, we're just setting, we're incrementing through that pattern that I showed earlier, that, that array of all the different values. And that's just generating that glow on and off. And as, it's, as this function call is called over and over again, it's just updating that, 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 PWM, thresh, that PWM duty cycle. And it's just uh, changing as the timer goes. And then if you're done with it, you stop the timer and then you set the PWM level to whatever static level you need to set it to, either on or off, or maybe you have a, di a different, uh, different pattern that you want to use. So. so we've covered a lot of ground. I think this is probably the longest live session I've done so far. GPIO setup, interrupts, flags for the GPIOs, PWM usage, and using, um, briefly at least, uh, using a timer to modify your PWM if you have like a pre-configured uh, kind of animation. So I have hoped I didn't confuse the crap out of all of you. I, I really hope it makes sense and please leave a comment. Um, let me know how what you think because uh, it is a tough s subject in Zephyr because it's from coming from a different embedded environment where it's just like, Set the duty cycle. Set the pin, set the duty cycle. No, I just want the pin on or off. What's all this extra stuff? Um, once you kind of get used to it, then it makes a little bit more sense and you're able to kind of run with it. And it's just that kind of like cognitive, like, oh, what? Uh, once you get used to it, it's great. And then, like I said, the main advantage is you can keep that same logic in that code and maybe change a board or change an overlay and then you don't have to change your code again, which is nice. So something to, something to keep, in, keep in mind when you're, you're playing around with Zephyr is like, that's the main, one of the main cool factors about Zephyrs. You can, you can change from silicon to silicon and your project will just work, which is awesome. Um, let me see if there's any other questions or comments. Christopher, thanks for joining, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, and thank, I'm glad it, it has helped you. Um, it's definitely uh, a bit of a confusion, confusing uh, thing. But once you get it going, it's like GPIOs. It's like, okay, it's second nature. On and off. PWM. Say your duty cycle. Okay, yeah, it's there. You just got to get jump through a couple hoops to get there. But thank you for joining. Really appreciate it. Um, but if anybody else has any questions, comments, you can leave them. Uh, down below, or you can shoot me a message on, um, you know, shoot me an email, and uh, we'll be seeing you next week. So, really appreciate everybody coming out, uh, and we'll see you next week. Don't forget. <laughs>